In 1873, a promising young writer named Mark Twain co-authored a book called The Gilded Age. Gilding was a common process in the 19th century in which a thin layer of gold was applied to a non-precious object, hence making it appear more valuable than it actually was. Twain's satiric novel poked fun at America's increasing obsession with getting rich quick. Historians adopted the phrase to describe the period of American history between 1870 and 1900 a period where the growth of industrialization and prosperity thinly disguised the corruption of politicians and businessmen that festered beneath the era's golden veneer. After the Civil War, America was at a crossroads. The once divided nation had been reunited, slavery had been abolished, and one of the nation's great presidents had been assassinated. Out of these turbulent times emerged a nation that bore little resemblance to the one Americans had known before. And an even greater change was just beginning, as America started to move from the farmland to the factory. Big business grew rapidly during the Gilded Age. This was due to several factors. New and improved machinery aided the workforce in producing an increased number of goods in a shorter amount of time. A new breed of American businessmen saw the ability to make huge profits by combining this new machinery with industries that had yet to realize their full potential. In 1870, an adventurous 30-year-old entrepreneur named John D. Rockefeller founded the Standard Oil Company. In the days before the automobile was invented, the primary use for oil was in the gas lamps that lit people's homes. The Standard Oil Company refined petroleum into kerosene for just this purpose. Steel was another industry whose potential had yet to be fully realized. In 1883, Andrew Carnegie bought Homestead Works in western Pennsylvania to add to his growing collection of steel mills. Carnegie had begun working at the age of 13 as a lowly assistant in a textile mill. But through his will and determination, he became one of the richest men in the world. Carnegie's mills were immensely profitable due to an increased demand for steel in the post-Civil War era. As cities and businesses boomed, steel was needed to erect tall buildings and build bridges. The greatest demand for steel, however, came from the industry that would change the country the most during the Gilded Age, the rapidly expanding railroad. At the end of the Civil War, there were just 35,000 miles of railroad track in the entire United States located chiefly in the lands east of the Appalachian mountain range. By 1900, there were 193,000 miles of track, including four transcontinental railroad lines that linked the east and west coasts. Nearly 60% of the domestically produced steel fed the seemingly endless appetite for new railroad tracks. The railroad drastically changed life in America. Prior to the Transcontinental Railroad, it took months to cross the country in slow, horse-drawn stagecoaches. The journey was arduous and dangerous, and many pioneers who left the East in search of a better life out West instead found their fates. The railroad cut travel time on the 3,000-mile trip from coast to coast from months to roughly one week. The rate of shipping and communication increased with the speed of the locomotive, and this had repercussions in almost every other industry in the Gilded Age. Railroad locomotives were powered by steam engine. This same technology was used to power thousands of machines in all facets of industry. The machines were capable of an exponentially larger output than mere manpower. This machinery was effective, but also very expensive. Large-scale corporations grew by raising the money needed to purchase these huge machines and utilizing the railroads as a means of tapping into new, larger markets. The new machinery and railroads had an especially powerful effect in the farmlands of America. Many farmers went into debt trying to purchase costly new farming machinery and the land needed to realize the potential of these machines. Farmers began to change what they grew as well, specializing in one or two cash crops to maximize profits and pay off mounting debts. 
This specialization made it so farmers were less self-sufficient, depending more on the marketplace than their fields for their livelihood. Farmers' problems were compounded by the railroad's high cost of shipping and the marketplace's comparatively low purchasing rates. Some farmers actually increased their profits considerably during this period by embracing the new marketplaces. Sadly, many were forced to eke out meager livings as independent farmers, or even worse, some lost their farms outright and had to work as farmhands or move into the cities to find work in factories. While the rise in new machinery robbed some men of their jobs, it created new jobs for others. Mechanics and machine operators were now more in demand than craftsmen. The majority of these new positions were made available in the factories of the nation's largest cities. As New York, Chicago, and Boston grew outward along the railways, a host of previously unskilled laborers were trained to meet the new demand for factory workers. Disillusioned farmers who moved up from the country filled part of the need, as did young men who grew up in the country but dreamed of finding their fortune in the cities. City population swelled as a result. New York's population doubled and Chicago's population quintupled. Even smaller cities boomed. Los Angeles had only 5,700 citizens in 1870. By 1900, the population was over 102,000. In the same period, the size of Philadelphia nearly doubled. Former country dwellers made up a large part of the new population in the cities. But the flood of immigrants entering the country also made up a large part of the new workforce. People from all parts of Europe were migrating to the United States in record numbers between 1870 and 1900. During the 1880s alone, around 5 million foreigners entered the country. Seeking political freedom and economic prosperity, most had to settle for difficult and dangerous low-paying factory jobs and cramped living quarters in filthy city tenement houses. 60-hour work weeks were not uncommon and benefits such as pensions or workers' compensation were practically unheard of. As cities grew, the need for new buildings opened up another avenue for employment in construction. For the first time, steel was being used in mass quantities to create the skeletal frames upon which the city's tallest buildings were built. Called skyscrapers, these buildings were often 10 to 20 stories high, and they stood as symbols of power and the achievement of the American dream. But much of that dream was denied to the immigrants, most of whom lived in poverty in the city's slums. The unsanitary living conditions in these neighborhoods led to outbreaks of typhoid and cholera, which spread quickly throughout the overcrowded, poorly ventilated tenement apartments. What the immigrants did have was the right to vote, and this meant political power to anyone who could swing that vote in their favor. Many corrupt politicians courted the immigrants' vote as a means of securing wins on election night. William Boss Tweed was the most infamous of these politicians. Tweed used bribery and other illegal tactics to sway immigrant votes and secure the power of Tammany Hall, the democratic political machine in New York City. Immigrants were not the only oppressed group to gain political power in the Gilded Age. In 1870, Hiram Revels became the first African-American to be elected into the United States Senate. Revels served as a Mississippi senator until March 4, 1871. Unfortunately, the political gains signified by Revels' election were short-lived. Many Southerners feared the political power that the newly freed African-Americans could wield, as blacks now outnumbered whites in the South. By 1877, Georgia had passed a law which taxed polling places, meaning that African Americans would have to pay money to place their vote. This tax was just the first of a host of legislation that swept throughout the South and served to disfranchise African Americans by robbing them of their voice in politics. In addition to the tax, literacy tests were a common means of disfranchisement. If you couldn't read, you couldn't vote. Since many of the former slaves had gone uneducated, the literacy test proved effective in robbing them of the right. When legislation didn't work, however, lynching and political violence did. The terrorized and disfranchised African Americans were also subject to Jim Crow laws, which enforced segregation. By the late 1890s, 
African Americans were stripped of most of the rights that were promised to them after the Civil War. In 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson. The ruling stated that separate but equal facilities and accommodations were legal under the Constitution. Everything from schools to public restrooms to railroad cars was changed to meet the standards set by the decision. Segregation was thereby legalized and stayed that way for nearly six decades. While African Americans were being denied their rights as citizens, the Native Americans were being denied their right to the land. At the time of the Civil War, it's estimated that 250,000 Native Americans lived between the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. As the Transcontinental Railroad brought settlers, farmers, prospectors, miners, and cattle ranchers out west, it was clear that a clash of cultures was imminent. The Indian Wars lasted for 25 years. Though the Native Americans were often outgunned and outmanned by the U.S. cavalry, they fought valiantly to defend their homeland. Though the battles often had heavy death tolls, it was the slaughter of the buffalo by railroad workers and frontiersmen that caused the most staggering damage to the Native Americans, who depended on the animal as a chief source of food, clothing, and shelter. Those Native Americans who survived were forced to live in reservations, often in the barren lands found undesirable by frontier speculators. Some refused reservation life. In 1876, a group of Apache warriors led by Geronimo escaped from the San Carlos Reservation in eastern Arizona and began an armed insurrection. Geronimo was forced into surrendering in 1883, but he soon escaped again. Geronimo's final surrender in 1886 marked the end of the last significant Native American guerrilla action in America. By that time, Geronimo's army was composed of only 16 warriors, 12 women, and 6 children. Geronimo and over 300 of his Apache followers were forcibly shipped to Fort Marion, Florida, where he could be more easily contained. The darkest time in Indian Wars came in 1890 in Wounded Knee, South Dakota. U.S. cavalrymen were in the process of disarming a group of captured Lakota Indians when it mistook the actions of one of them to be hostile. The cavalrymen opened fire, and when the smoke cleared, 250 Native American men, women, and children were dead. The massacre served as a symbol of the negative aspect of America's conquest of the frontier. Life in the frontier couldn't have been more different than life in the cities back east. As the wealth of the upper classes increased, many Americans sought a culture that would befit their fortunes. The culture that emerged was heavily influenced by the manners, attitudes, and fashions of Queen Victoria's England. These American Victorians filled their homes with ornate furniture and knickknacks, believing their newfound wealth could buy them everything, including class. Appearance was everything for Victorian women. According to the styles of the period, women grew their hair very long, but never presented themselves without styling it atop their heads. They wore floor-length gowns made of silk or satin and adorned with bustles. Men, too, were concerned with their appearance. While little change occurred in styles of dress, beards became very popular for the first time. Aided by images of Western virility and Abe Lincoln's legacy, it seemed no Victorian man could be without facial hair. Little boys were often dressed by their mothers in fancy velvet suits with lace ruffles, while little girls emulated their mothers in every way, throwing tea parties for their dolls as training for their future Victorian life. Victorians were eager to imitate European high culture in their conversations about art and society. They also sought pleasure outside the home, and the Gilded Age offered a wealth of entertainment possibilities. Sporting events were becoming more popular, especially college football. Despite a gentlemanly custom of never playing a sport for money, professional baseball gained in spectators and was slowly becoming the national pastime. Great traveling spectacles like Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show and P.T. Barnum's Circus enthralled audiences eager to experience the excitement of the wild frontier or gawk at human curiosities and death-defying stunts. These types of shows were promoted with flair and bright posters and by the flamboyant showmen themselves. Another form of promotion began as the new industry of newspaper advertising kicked into gear. 
Many Americans were conned into buying any number of cure-all medicines, potions, and salves. Some were sold as Indian cures discovered in the frontier. Others were patented doctor's formulas that claimed to cure any number of ailments. The fraudulent medicines promised salvation from fatal illnesses like typhoid and consumption, but in reality, they were seldom more than hard alcohol dressed up with a few added ingredients. Often compiled into huge almanacs and distributed to families, the ads were interspersed with anecdotes, astrology, and jokes that entertained millions of Americans by the end of the 19th century. Also, a golden age of American literature offered literate Americans a wealth of reading material. In addition to the novels of Mark Twain, Americans loved the rag-to-riches tales of Horatio Alger and the sensitively drawn female protagonists of novelist Henry James' masterpieces. The burgeoning theatrical industry put Victorian morals center stage. Melodramas featured clear-cut narratives showcasing handsome and chivalrous heroes who would save innocent virtuous women from the clutches of evil and dastardly villains. Variety shows like vaudeville were also hugely popular. Vaudeville was a mixture of comedy and musical numbers that were suitable for family viewing. It seemed that whatever type of show audiences were looking for could be easily found in the theaters of the era. Not all women were resigned to lives of simple domesticity like the Victorians. The women's suffrage movement was still in its infancy, and it would still be many years until women were given the right to vote, but society was beginning to change to their benefit. More women were joining the workforce than ever before. More than half of America's colleges turned coeducational and began graduating women as doctors, lawyers, and other high-ranking professionals. They also joined volunteer committees like the Daughters of the American Revolution and the General Federation of Women's Clubs. Among their causes were education, conservation, temperance, and aiding the less fortunate. Reformers won major victories in regard to education. Between 1870 and 1900, 31 state legislatures passed compulsory education laws, meaning that young children were legally obligated to go to school. By 1898, roughly 15 million children were attending school on a regular basis. In the immigrant community, one reformer in particular made a significant contribution. Jane Addams set up settlement houses in many of the nation's big cities. The houses offered a variety of clubs, functions, and education classes to immigrants. One of her most noted establishments, the Hull House in Chicago, still stands as a testament to her unwavering dedication and her tireless lobbying for the rights of the underprivileged. Religion still played a dominant role in American life. A revivalist movement swept through the nation, spurred along by charismatic and theatrical evangelists like Dwight Moody. But tensions were growing between the Protestant citizens and the incoming wave of Catholic and Jewish immigrants, who were seen as a threat to the American way of life. The distrust of these minority groups was strongest among the farmers in the South and West and the upper-class Victorians in New England. The workplace was also a hotbed of inequality and mounting tension. As the rich got richer, the poor factory workers grew to resent the long hours, low pay, and lack of benefits. Labor unions represented only a minority of workers at the time, but more and more workers were interested in reforms that unions strove to achieve. In 1886, a nationwide strike broke out. Workers wanted the grueling 12-hour workday changed to a reasonable 8-hour day. 12,000 companies throughout the country were affected by the strike, with nearly 340,000 workers walking out of the workplace and onto the picket line. During one demonstration in Chicago, a bomb exploded as police were trying to break up the unrest, and one police officer was killed. The rest of the police opened fire into the crowd, killing one laborer and wounding many more. Four of the labor organizers were held responsible for the deadly riot and were hanged as a result. In 1892, workers went on strike at Andrew Carnegie's Homestead Works steel mill. The management held firm, refusing to compromise with the workers. Government soldiers were then called in. The troops used force and quickly broke the spirit of the picketing workers, who returned to work without making any real progress. Another economic downturn called the Panic of 1893 rocked the economy and fueled even more drastic disputes between the impoverished laborers and the corporate management officials who were increasingly seen as the enemy. 
1894, workers boycotted and picketed George Pullman's railroad works. Enraged when Pullman slashed employee wages and raised rents in his company town, the workers refused to work and rallied against any railroads that used Pullman cars. Over 250,000 workers went on strike and railroad traffic was severely affected. Again, U.S. troops were called in to crush the strikers and return the railroads to working order. The Pullman strike was also a failure. Many of the organizers were imprisoned and many of the laborers were blacklisted from future work in the railroad industry. Both the Homestead strike and the Pullman strike were quickly broken up by government soldiers. This was proof of the United States government's sympathy for big business. Legislators of the period often thought of labor unions as communistic and opposed to American ideals of capitalism. Though small strikes sometimes succeeded in bringing small reforms, nearly all large strikes ended disastrously for labor. Labor organizers who led the strikes were blamed by government officials for violence and civil unrest whenever labor disputes got out of hand. Whenever possible, unions were broken up and their leaders blacklisted. Management went so far as to force laborers into signing contracts that stated they would not rejoin a union. By the late 1890s, the government and businessmen seemed to be winning the war with laborers as membership in unions decreased significantly. It would be many years before unions would rise again and win the benefits they demanded. Many Americans grew suspicious of corporations and businessmen fearing price fixing by all powerful monopolies. They saw the Carnegies and Rockefellers of the world as robber barons who fixed prices and stole from the honest, hard-working Americans to increase their personal fortunes. In response, Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act. The act created an agency that could oversee and regulate corporations without eliminating private enterprise. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed. It sought to restrain the spread of monopolies but it lacked the power to affect any real change. However, these laws set a precedent in voicing citizens' demands for federal regulation. This continued to be a major concern in the 20th century. During the Gilded Age, politics was a large part of everyday life. Between 1870 and 1900, voter participation reached an all-time high, often exceeding 70% in the northern states. The Republican Party dominated, with support in the North and West, which stemmed from the Civil War. The Democratic Party mixed the immigrant Catholic political machines of the North with the Anglo-Saxon Protestant South. Cultural and religious issues often shaped the outcome of elections. Newspapers offered coverage of political events that was often slanted by the party affiliation of the owner. Entire families went to campaign rallies and listened to speeches by the great orators of the day. Republicans had a platform that supported protection for commerce and industry, sought to strengthen the government's involvement with the economy and champion African-American rights in the South. On the other hand, Democrats fought for limited government, states' rights, and white rule and segregation in the South. While Republicans supplied most of the presidents of the period, neither party held the vast majority in the houses of Congress. Corruption ran rampant in the Gilded Age and extended to the highest levels of government. During the Grant administration of 1869 to 1877, the president and members of his cabinet were implicated in no less than four major scandals. The gold conspiracy involved cornering the market in gold and led to a drop in the stock market. In what came to be known as the salary grab, government officials had their pay rates raised retroactively. Another scandal, the whiskey ring, sought to evade U.S. taxes in the manufacture of whiskey. One of the most damaging of all these scandals, however, was Credit Mobile Credit Mobile was a Pennsylvania holding company that was chartered by Congress to build the Union Pacific Railroad. The company overcharged the railroad to the tune of $23 million. A chief operating officer for both the railroad and the holding company sold stock in Credit Mobile at drastically reduced prices to U.S. congressmen and members of Grant's cabinet to assure that no congressional investigation would take place. When the New York Sun newspaper broke the story in 1872, it became clear to many Americans that even their most trusted politicians were not immune from the get-rich fever that pervaded the era. 
In the wake of his election, President Grant used political patronage by giving inexperienced friends and supporters top cabinet positions. Grant's administration paid the price as scandal after scandal broke when his trusted friends put their pursuit of wealth above their oath of office. The corruption continued into Rutherford B. Hayes' administration. Nominated as a reform candidate, Hayes soon disappointed many of the Republicans who'd elected him due to his rewarding supporters with high-ranking government jobs. This caused a rift in the Republican Party that led to two distinct groups, nicknamed the Stalwarts and the Half-Breeds. The Stalwarts were the conservative faction who disagreed with Hayes' attempts to reconcile with the South and opposed any change in the existing patronage system of appointing cabinet members. The half-breeds were a more moderate group who were in favor of reconciliation with the South and supported moderate civil service reform, meaning that the patronage system would have to be changed. James A. Garfield, a half-breed affiliate, was elected president in 1880. He was assassinated the next year by a member of the stalwart faction, and the usage of the two terms in reference to differing ideals in the party ceased soon afterwards. During the economic panic of 1873, agricultural prices were declining. Farmers who were already suffering financially due to industrialization and urbanization were in even greater turmoil as they saw their profits slip away. Many of these farmers believed that it was the eastern bankers and businessmen who were setting the government's currency policy, and they began seeking change. Loosely knit farmers alliances were formed during the 1880s and they lobbied for regulation of the railroads, tax reform, and the free and unlimited coinage of silver. The pleas of these groups went largely ignored by the Republicans and Democrats. But the growth of the farmers alliances was so rapid that talk of a third political party soon began. In 1892, a political convention in Omaha marked the birth of the Populist Party. The populist platform centered mainly on the free coinage of silver, graduated income tax, government ownership of transportation and communication, and most improbably, the complete abolition of national banks. Other populist agendas include civil service reform, shortening the workday to eight hours, immigration reform, and a law that stated that non-citizens could not be landowners. The populists gained the most support among farmers in the West and South, who were increasingly disillusioned with the Democratic Party. But industrial workers in the East were also drawn to the new party by the promise of a shorter workday and pensions. In 1892, the populists ran their first candidate for president and received over one million popular votes, a surprising show of strength for a fledgling party. In the 1894 midterm congressional elections, populist candidates collected nearly a million and a half votes. This startling increase proved that many Americans favored populist politics, and the Democratic Party took note. In 1896, the Democratic presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, eloquently spoke on behalf of the adopted populist idea of free silver coinage. This change in party platform swung the majority of populist votes to the Democrats, who in turn lost to the Republican candidate, William McKinley. This defeat, coupled with rising farm prices, brought about the dissolution of the populist party. The Gilded Age was also the period in which America shifted from being isolationist to being an internationally active world power. In 1893, the Western frontier was officially closed. For the previous 300 years of its existence, the dominant fact of American life had been expansion. But a new frontier was just beginning as economic prospects around the world led businessmen to seek new markets beyond the borders of the United States. In 1887, the U.S. Navy established a base at Pearl Harbor on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. By 1893, the government of Hawaii was overthrown and it was soon annexed as a territory of the United States. But it was not until 1898 that the U.S. truly displayed its new power. Just off the coast of Florida, Spain was busy suppressing a revolt in its territory, Cuba. American sympathy for the Cuban revolutionaries was encouraged by sensational reports in many American newspapers. When the U.S. battleship Maine exploded off the coast of Havana, 
newspapers blamed the Spanish, and America declared war on Spain shortly thereafter. The Spanish-American War was very short-lived, only four months in total, but it introduced Americans to a hero who would be a constant factor in the years to come. As assistant secretary to the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt organized the ships that defeated the Spanish fleet and cleared the way for the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. Roosevelt then organized the U.S. Volunteer Cavalry Regiment, nicknamed the Rough Riders because of their formidable fighting abilities. Roosevelt led the regiment in the Battle of San Juan Hill and won a decisive victory over the Spanish Army. As a result of the Spanish-American War, Cuba became a protectorate in Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam became United States territories. The most significant hero of the war, Teddy Roosevelt, became President of the United States in 1901. Just three years after the war had ended, he would lead America into a period of unparalleled reform. The United States would be further impacted by four unique inventions of the Gilded Age. Invented by Thomas Edison, the electric light would change the way people left their homes. And the motion picture would go on to change the notions of entertainment and culture. Alexander Graham Bell's invention, the telephone, was starting to change the way people communicated. In 1876, the year the invention debuted, there were only 3,000 telephones in the entire country. By 1900, that number was well over a million and rapidly growing each year. It was during the Gilded Age that the world got its first look at the automobile. Called the horseless carriage, the automobile would change the face of transportation in the coming decades. The Gilded Age was a difficult era in the history of the United States. It was a period of immense growing pains during which Americans were forced to adapt as their country rapidly changed around them. This resulted in an especially dark period in America's treatment of ethnic and racial minorities. But the Gilded Age also had a share of triumphs. In a relatively short period of time, the economy was industrialized, the country's biggest cities were modernized, and the two-party system was strengthened and refined. Reforms were few and corruption was plentiful, but the confidence of the American people persevered and the optimism they exhibited helped lay the foundation upon which the America of the 20th century would be built.